With the beginning of our 24th year of on-the-air amateur radio news right around the corner, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1245 of This Week in Amateur Radio. It is a really busy news week, and we start out with a whole list of headline stories that we're going to cover for you, including the state of Ohio enacts a new distracted driving law. Amateurs learn that they are exempt. The ARRL Volunteers on the Air event began on New Year's Day. We will have all the details on this year-long event. More amateur radio astronauts are heading to the International Space Station. We will introduce you to them. A new ARRL section manager is appointed in Connecticut. Amateurs are not the only ones with satellite access anymore, as the new generation of smartphones offer that capability. New members are added to the upcoming Beauvais Island de-expedition. The Radio Society of Great Britain is looking for position nominations. Amateurs in Switzerland are allocated the 4-meter band, while amateurs in Germany get renewed allocations. The FCC proposes additional spectrum at 5 gigahertz for drone communications. The BBC is planning for a future without over-the-air broadcasting. A new over-the-horizon radar system is planned for the island nation of Palu. The radio regulator in Malaysia introduces changes to the amateur radio structure in that country. A new high-efficiency antenna design may spell the end for Bluetooth. We will have more details on the latest harp experiment with an asteroid. And remember Rosie the robot made from the Jetsons? Well, there are many challenges in creating robotic servants for the home, and it may take at least a decade to overcome these limitations. We will tell you when you will have Rosie in your shack coming up in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features, We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, takes a look back at what radio was like when he was a kid and takes a look at Starlink and how it will avoid the Kessler effect. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, what is the weakest signal that Whisper can decode properly? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill will take us back to May 3rd, 1963. That's when the AWRL proposed its own version of incentive licensing. Then fast forward to 1965, when the FCC proposes in its version to demote advanced class hams. A revision will happen, and again in 1965, the FCC releases the incentive licensing structure we basically still operate under today. Bill will have all the details for us in this week's report. Our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will answer the question, you have secured a new commercial tower site for your repeater, but the antenna placement requires you to mount your vertical antenna upside down. Now what do you do? That's all straight ahead in this expanded edition of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service. This week in amateur radio, and we take to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in Albany, New York, where we haven't seen the sun in about a week, they're saying maybe tomorrow, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. Coming to you live from just outside the capital of New York State, Albany, New York, and Glenmont, this is Bob, W3BOO, Boo Radio. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, in the Geek Cave studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, kb 2 MOB. And reporting from a very mild Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I'm starting to wonder where the heck is winter? I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, just wondering where she went. 
And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off the news this week, according to the Springfield News Sun newspaper, under a new law taking effect in Ohio, if you're holding a cell phone or similar device in your hands while operating a motor vehicle, that is sufficient reason for you to be stopped by the police. It is considered a primary offense. Hams, however, needn't worry. The distracted driving law exempts radio amateurs as well as utility workers and first responders such as police and volunteer fire. Penalties are increasing for those drivers found to be engaged in so-called distracted driving, but with the new law, the next six months will provide a grace period. Drivers who are not eligible for the exemption will only be issued warnings while the state launches a public education campaign about the change in enforcement. With this law, Ohio joins the ranks of other states where exemptions were granted for amateur radio use while driving, including Indiana, New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Washington State, to name a few. ARRL's year-long operating event, Volunteers on the Air, or VOTA, began on New Year's Day, January 1st, 2023. John Ross, KB8, IDJ, is at League Headquarters with all the details on this exciting event. The event is organized as part of ARRL's 2023 theme, Year of the Volunteers, which recognizes the contributions of ARRL member volunteers and offers opportunities to become more active and involved in amateur radio and ARRL. VOTA encourages participants to make contacts with ARRL members and volunteers earning points for each contact. Point values have been assigned, and you are able to see the points table now at vota.arrl.org. All scoring is automatically calculated through ARRL's Logbook of the World. If you're already a Logbook of the World user, continue to upload your QSOs there to participate. If you're a new Logbook of the World user, visit the website Getting Started with Low TW. As part of the event, there will be week-long activations by W1AW and portable stations operating in all U.S. states and territories. W1AW portable operations are worth five points for each contact, and they will be contacted on all bands and modes. There will also be an opportunity to earn the W1AW Worked All States Award, and there will be two week-long W1AW operations from each of the 50 states. Later in the event, an online scoreboard, the VOTA Leaderboard, will be activated, allowing each participant to see how their score measures up with other participants throughout the year. Join the fun. Visit the official VOTA website for further details, vota.arrl.org. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Only two-way contacts qualify for points. However, cross-band, cross-mode, and repeater contacts are not valid. You can use any mode, CW, phone, or digital, including Earth, Moon, Earth, and satellite operations on 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10, 6, 2, and 1.25 meters, as well as 70 centimeters, VHF, UHF, SHF, and microwave bands available to U.S. amateurs above 2 meters. 2190, 630, 60, 30, 17, and 12 meter band contacts are not counted for credit in this event. Visit the official Volunteers on the Air website for further details. That address again is vota.arrl.org. The Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission have introduced changes to the amateur radio operation structure effective January 1, 2023, to ensure the certification that Malaysia is in line with the practice in other countries. MCMC said the changes include examination format, examination syllabus, qualification requirements to sit for the examinations, and the introduction of the new Class C. It also involves the Morse code examination to upgrade to Class A which is now replaced by a computerized multiple-choice exam and the use of frequency and beam power limits for each class. MCMC said the changes were also aimed at encouraging students' interest in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics through amateur radio, which would lead to the rise of amateur radio operators who can help during disasters. The Malaysian regulator, MCMC, also announced that it had published a handbook on amateur radio, first edition, as an additional reference to those interested to sit for the amateur radio examinations. A question bank was also created by MCMC for all three amateur radio classes to provide exposure to the public on examples of examination questions as well as to assist candidates to prepare in advance. All three documents can be found on the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission's official website. 
Starting on the 1st of January, hams in Switzerland will be allowed to operate on the 4-meter band using all commonplace simplex modes. The Swiss Amateur Radio Association, USKA, reported recently that their communications authorities have granted approval to hams holding HB9 licenses for a maximum operating power of 25 watts effective radiated power. HAMS may operate only on frequencies between 70 MHz and 70.0375 MHz. They also have permission for the range between 70.1125 and 70.5000 MHz. Relays and Echolink gateways will not be permitted on the band, and any stations being operated via remote control must get permission from the regulator Ofcom. CH. Three of the four new astronauts on February's planned launch of the SpaceX Crew-6 mission to the International Space Station are amateur radio operators. Pilot Warren Woody Hoberg, KB3HTZ, Commander Stephen Bowen, KI5BKB, and Mission Specialist Sultan Al Nayad, KI5VTV. They'll join Mission Specialist Andrew Fadev on board the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft Endeavour. The spacecraft will be atop a Falcon 9 rocket, and while a launch date has not been selected, the earliest date would be mid-February 2023. All crew members have learned about amateur radio on the International Space Station, received guidance on studying and testing, learned how to operate the ARIS radios, and the basics on the air protocol for ARIS team members at NASA's Johnson Space Center. The crew will be able to participate in ARIS using the ham radio station on the International Space Station to contact schools and other educational institutions. ARIS is a cooperative venture of international amateur radio societies and the space agencies that support the ISS. In the U.S., participating organizations include NASA, the ISS National Lab, ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, and AMSAT. Amateur radio operators are not the only people with access to satellites anymore. Some new smartphones are gaining a new capability, direct satellite access. Text messaging that uses satellite communications will be possible for some consumers using Huawei and Apple devices, according to a recent report in the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers publication, Spectrum. While Apple and Huawei expect to use older satellites that are already in orbit by putting new chips in their flagship handsets, new low-Earth orbit satellite networks are also being built. Those are in the works from startup companies Link Global and AST Space Mobile, which hope to provide service to 5G phones in areas without terrestrial coverage. Observers note that this satellite functionality on smartphones will not include the ability to make phone calls or to stream data, but its added capacity of texting will provide another means of calling for help in an emergency in regions where the caller has a clear view to the sky. Working in partnership with Global Star, Apple devices have offered a service called Emergency SOS via satellite since last November. Huawei, however, has not yet announced the date of its rollout. Meanwhile, Link Global expects to begin operations in the new year, and AST Space Mobile expects to launch five of its satellites later this year. Although the window is closed for nominations for board director of the Radio Society of Great Britain, the nomination period continues through to the end of January for other roles, such as regional representative, elected director, and president. The current president, Stuart Bryant, G3YSX, is completing his two-year term in April. There are nine volunteer roles in all that need to be filled. Regional representatives are needed for England Southwest and the Channel Islands, England Northwest, East Midlands, Northern Ireland, and South Wales. Further details can be found on the Society's website at rsgb.org stroke election. The Society will be holding its annual general meeting on April 15th. We will have the results for you when they are officially announced. Only members of the Radio Society of Great Britain are able to nominate candidates.
Bud Kozlov, W1NSK, has been appointed as the AWRL Connecticut Section Manager starting on January 1st, 2023. For more details, we go to John Ross, KD8IDJ, who files this report. Kozlov, who lives in Reading, Connecticut, is currently the president of the Candlewood Amateur Radio Association and a member of the Yankee Clipper Contest Club. He was appointed by ARRL Field Service Manager Mike Walters, W8ZY, after consulting with the New England Division Director Fred Kemmerer, AB1OC. His term of office continues through September 30th, 2024. Kazloff takes a uh, reins of the Connecticut Section Organization from Betsy Doan, K1EIC, who was appointed by ARRO headquarters as the Connecticut Section Manager in November 2022 to fulfill the role on a temporary basis until a full-time Section Manager could be appointed. I'm John Ross, KD8IDJ. Betsy Doan of Shelton was previously the Connecticut Section Manager for 25 years from 1991 to 2016. Chuck Motes, K1DFS of Plainville, served as Connecticut section manager for the last six years. He decided not to run for a new term of office when his third term concluded on September 30th, 2022. According to AM International, the torch has been passed at Amplitude Modulation International. John McGrath, N9AMI, has become executive director, succeeding Dale Gagnon, KW1I. In 1993, Dale was one of the group's founders who announced AM International's formation during the Dayton Hamvention. The founders created a group that would both celebrate and advocate for amplitude modulation, the original voice on the amateur bands. According to the AMI website, members are encouraged to participate in all kinds of activity within the group's 10 regions and to be active in annual operating events and contests. AMI also monitors all FCC and ARRL activity that would have an impact on operators using AM. Writing on the recently updated website, Dale tells members that there are some new changes in the works. An online forum has been added to the website to give amateurs a greater voice in the issues they care about. He writes that the forum is open to anyone interested in AM operation and not limited to AMI membership only. He will also be introducing a new program called AMI on 10 and intends to bring back the Thanksgiving Jamboree. Dale is encouraging visitors to the website. You can visit AM International at aminternational.club. The long-awaited Bouvet Island de-expedition team has added new operators to its ranks. Two Norwegian radio operators who are now part of the de-expedition intend to operate from the island under their own calls for a limited time. Germund 3Y slash LB5GI and Erwan 3Y slash LB1Q are scheduled toward the end of the 3Y0J team's expected 22-day activation late this month. The news was reported on January 1st on the website dxworld.net, which gave confirmation from Ken, LA7GIA, co-leader of the Bouvet team. Ken said that this would be the first time any Norwegian with an LB call sign operated from Bouvet. The game plan is apparently to have 3Y0J pilot stations inform eager DX hunters when the pair get on the air. The Service Academy's radio group, known as Sarge, was recently formed for alumni and amateur radio operators who are interested in the five U.S. military academies. John Ross, KD8IDJ, is at League Headquarters and files this special report. William Curry, W5CQ, founder and net control operator for the Sarge Net, said two months ago there was a new interest in forming a group in net. He noticed that only one military academy, West Point, W2KGY, still was operating a club station. At one time, every military academy had an operating club station. The club stations at the U.S. Military Academy, U.S. Naval Academy, U.S. Air Force Academy, the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, and the U.S. Maritime Academy have all been off the air now for some time, said Curry. But now we have 50 new members who are all interested in promoting amateur radio at all of the academies. The Sarge Net meets every Thursday at 2200 UTC on 7.280 MHz and every Saturday at 1600 UTC on 14.338 MHz. All amateur radio operators, whether they are veterans or just have an interest in the military or history of the academies, are invited. I'm John Ross, KD8 IDJ. Curry has been licensed since 1950 and holds an amateur extra class license. He is also an ARRL life member. For additional information about the Service Academy's radio group NET, contact Curry at W5CQ at ARRL.net. In Germany, the Federal Network Agency 
Benetza, has extended temporary allocations for amateur operation in part of the 160 meter, the 6 and 4 meter, and the 13 and 6 centimeter bands. These permissions were to have expired at the end of this year, but are now granted anew until the 31st of December 2023. According to a Google translation of the announcement in the Agency Gazette, 6 meter band operation is allowed in the 50 to 50.4 megahertz frequency range. Class A license holders may use a maximum of 750 watts PEP, and Class E license holders can transmit with a maximum of 100 watts PEP with operation only permitted using horizontal polarization. For the frequency range between 50.4 and 52 megahertz, only 25 watts PEP is allowed, but contest operation is permitted. On the 4 meter band, operation is granted up to 25 watts ERP using horizontal polarization by Class A license holders and on frequencies between 70.150 and 70.210 MHz. At the top end of 160 meters, Class both A and E license holders may use their permitted maximum transmission power operating at weekends within the frequencies 1.85 and 2.0 MHz. Contest operation on 160 meters is only allowed on these frequencies and on the weekend. Finally, holders of license class E are given access to the 13 and 6 centimeter bands from 2320 to 2450 MHz and 5650 to 5850 MHz with a maximum power of 5 watts PEP so that they can take part in the HamNet mesh data network. The Federal Communications Commission this past Wednesday proposed new rules to make licensed radio spectrum in the 5 GHz band for the rising number of unmanned aircraft systems, or drones, in use. Currently, drones typically operate under unlicensed and low-power wireless communication rules or experimental licenses. The FCC also said it's seeking comment on whether current rules for various spectrum bands are sufficient to ensure coexistence of drones and terrestrial mobile operations. The FCC is also proposing a process for drone operators to obtain a license in the aeronautical VHF band to communicate with air traffic control and other aircraft. The FCC must ensure that our spectrum rules meet the current and future spectrum needs of evolving technologies such as unmanned aircraft systems, which can be critical to disaster recovery, first responder rescue efforts, and wildfire management, FCC Chair Jessica Rosenworcel said. Because drones are usually operated remotely, they depend critically on wireless communications between a ground-based control station and the drone to control the flight, the FCC said. The FCC said as drone flights increasingly involve operations with a higher risk profile, such as flights that use large aircraft, carry heavy cargo or human passengers, or travel into the controlled airspace used by commercial passenger aircraft, operators have a growing need for the greater reliability that interference-protected license spectrum provides. Rules adopted by the Federal Aviation Administration for small drones to fly over people and at night took effect in April 2021. Abstract submission is now open for the 6th Annual HAMSI Workshop to be held March 17th and 18th, 2023, in person at the University of Scranton and virtually on Zoom. The workshop is very student and citizen scientist friendly and all amateur radio operators are invited to attend. The abstract submission form and more details are available at hamsci.org forward slash hamsci2023. Abstracts are due February 1st, 2023. The theme of the 2023 Hamsci workshop is Forging Amateur Professional Bonds. The primary objective is to bring together the amateur radio community and professional scientists. While Hamsci's main focus is atmospheric and radio science, presentations are welcome from all related parts of the coupled geopaced system including the sun, solar wind, magnetosphere, neutral atmosphere, and more. For more information, contact Dr. Nathaniel Frizzell, W2NAF at nathaniel.frizzell at scranton.edu. What happens if the British Broadcasting Corporation stops broadcasting? According to BBC Director General Tim Davey, that question isn't rhetorical and instead points toward the future of one of the world's most storied broadcasters. For the BBC, Internet-only distribution is an opportunity to connect more deeply with our audiences and to provide them with better services and choice than over-the-air broadcast allows. It provides significant editorial opportunities. A switch off of broadcast will and should happen over time, and we should be active in planning for it, Tim Davey said. 
Davies' speech before the Royal Television Society came 100 years and 23 days after the BBC's first broadcast, but it focused on the challenges and opportunities the broadcaster faces today. In Davies' vision, the United Kingdom and the BBC must begin work today to prepare for an Internet-only future. This will involve ensuring every British household is connected via fixed-line broadband and full national 4G, 5G wireless coverage. Goodbye, Bluetooth! The most common short-range wireless data exchange technology as it's now set to face the threat of extension unleashed by a scientist from Bankura, India, with his newer micro-device that's set to serve the digital gadgets soon. The scientist has been offered the patent for a revolutionary wireless antenna that can help data transfer 100 times faster than Bluetooth. Called the Super Compact Ultra Wideband Antenna, the micro device was developed by Professor Srikanta Paul, who in October was awarded the patent right by Center's Patent Office, for which Professor Paul had applied in July 2013. Professor Paul said, this is the world's smallest antenna. It's size 14 millimeters by 11 millimeters with about a 10 to 1 bandwidth. It has almost a constant impedance bandwidth gain and omnidirectional radiation pattern. The Republic of Palu is an island country and microstate in the Western Pacific. The nation has approximately 340 islands and connects the western chain of the Caroline Islands with parts of the Federated States of Micronesia. Construction of a new shortwave radar for the United States Air Force is currently underway on Palu. This was announced by the U.S. Ministry of Defense at the end of December 2022. Over-the-horizon radars already top the list of reported intruders on our high-frequency amateur radio bands. So it looks like by the end of 2026, no more QRM. This long-range radar, called Tactical Mobile Over-the-Horizon Radar, will play a special role in monitoring Chinese activities in the Pacific and the South China Sea. According to the publication The War Zone, the Palu Over-the-Horizon Radar will consist of a remote-controlled transmitting site and a separate receiving site consisting of 128 dual monopole antenna elements. If you know a young amateur radio operator who's been especially generous in giving time to assist an older person, a military veteran, or the community at large, you might know a candidate for the Radio Club of America's Young Ham Lends a Hand Award. Candidates may also be youth involved in recruiting others to get their licenses. Carol Perry, WB2MGP, is accepting nominations until April 1st for the award, which will be presented along with a $100 stipend at the Youth Forum during the 2023 Dayton Hamvention. Email your nominee's name, call sign, age, address, and phone number, along with the reasons for your nomination, to Carol Perry at WB2MGP at gmail.com. With the league's Straight Key Night, an annual January 1st event already in the books, the Straight Key Century Club is keeping the fun going for CW operators around the world to the end of the month. On January 2nd, operators who are club members began calling CQ with various call signs starting with K3Y from all 10 United States call areas as K3Y stroke 0 through K3Y stroke 9. Outside of the continental United States, club members are calling as K3Y stroke KH6, KL7, and KP4. Across six continents, operators will be on the air with stations for the special event. You will hear them calling CQSKM using their own call signs. These are stations in Africa, Asia, Europe, North America, Oceania, and South America. This annual event celebrates the founding of the Straight Key Century Club in 2006 and pays tribute to the earliest telegraphy keys, the Straight Key, the Bug, and the Sideswiper, also known as the Cootie. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 
Any way that the internet and the computing and digital technology are changing our lives, that's what we talk about right here. And boy, they are, aren't they? I used to listen to them when I was a kid. From a lot of my life, my early life, and that's probably why I got into radio, I used to uh, lie in bed late at night and listen to the radio. Did you do that? I used to listen to baseball games. I remember in 1969, I was lying in bed. In, uh, we lived in Rhode Island, and I was hearing about all the kids. I was 13. I was hearing all about the ki all the kids going up to Woodstock, how the roads were jammed. And I was thinking, I wish I were going to Woodstock. And I used to, you'd have to do it at night because uh, you, could, oh, you couldn't quite get it, but I used to tune in WOR in New York and listen to Gene Shepard late at night. Great, the great radio legend. Then later, uh, when I was in college, I would actually get up, and this is for a college kid unusual, I would get up at 6 in the morning didn't have class, but I wanted to listen to Imus in the morning on uh, WNBC. And Reverend Billy Saul, Hargis, and all of the characters he used to do in that. But I think that's, you know what, now that I think about it, that's probably why I got into this business. And tech can be a lot of things these days. You know, when I first started doing this show back in the early 90s. Yes, the early 90s. Uh, it was pretty much PCs. If you were really uh, cray cray and uh, and liberal, you might talk about Macs, which I did because I loved the Mac from the day it came out in 1984. You didn't really there was no internet to speak of. Nobody was using it except in universities. So in the early 90s, that's it. <laughs> A lot of stuff like I got an interrupt request conflict, <laughs> IRC conflict. I can't print with the parallel port. That kind of stuff. Now it's everything because tech's in everything from your car to your microwave to your home theater, your phone, of course. You carry a supercomputer in your pocket. Something, you know, in the early 90s, we would have just gone, oh. I remember <laughs> in 94, I think, Micron came out with, oh, this was so exciting, a new Pentium-based Windows machine that was operating at 90 megahertz. And I thought, I remember playing with it thinking, this is so fast. I feel slippery. Whoa, I can't keep up. <laughs> Single core, 90 megahertz. That was state of the art. Today, Intel announced their latest i9 processor. It has, well, no, I can't remember if it's four or eight cores. I think it's eight cores. And they're running not at 90 megahertz, but at 5,000 megahertz, five gigahertz, times eight cores, yes, eight cores, <laughs> compared to 90 megahertz at one core. That's, um, and the computer in your, in your pocket is running at multiples of gigahertz, usually around two gigahertz, which is, again, 2,000 megahertz. Compare that to 90. <laughs> Memory's faster and much more plentiful. We were, oh, back then we were happy if you had, you know, a couple of megabytes, megabytes of RAM. I remember going to a computer store, guy saying, all you'd ever need is eight megabytes of RAM. You got two for your computer, your operating system, <laughs> two for the program, megabytes, not gigabytes, megabytes, two for the program and two for your RAM disk. Remember RAM disks? <laughs> and I can't remember what the other two was. <laughs> this guy was speaking very authoritatively at the time. <laughs> he probably wasn't too, too wrong. I just read a story in Computer World. Computer World now has been around for a long time, since 1967. It's still around, which is kind of neat. The, you know, that, that's, I think, got to be the longest-running um, computer magazine of all. 50 years, right? 50 plus. In 1967, when Computer World started publishing a megabyte, and again, I'm, I'm emphasizing the M here, not, not gigabyte, not terabyte, megabyte, smaller than a floppy, megabyte hard drive would, would cost $1 million. One million dollars a megabyte. Today, a megabyte on a hard drive about two cents. Actually, that's that's actually pretty high. Um, we're seeing uh, spinning hard drives down at a nickel a gigabyte, a gigabyte, and uh, even SSDs are down below ten cents a gigabyte. <laughs> so yeah, things have changed a little bit since I started <laughs> I started doing this. And if you want to take a trip back, I always like reading old computer magazines because it's kind of fun to see how far we've come in such a sh in really such a short time. Uh, let's see what else is uh, in the news. All right, all right, stand corrected. We have some Air Force people in here who tell me that Krypton is a real gas. It's not made up. It's not Superman. That's Kryptonite. 
<laughs> Krypton is a real gas. Although, it's Elon Musk's new little satellites are the first time they've ever used Krypton to, to power satellites, to propel satellites. It's really important, though, that these satellites, and they have, and this worries me, <laughs> I hope it's not Tesla self-driving. They are self, they're autonomous. They're self-driving satellites. And because, as you might imagine, with 12,000 of them up there, plus lots of other space debris, some of it, you know, there's a, I think there, as I remember, there's a wrench in orbit that an astronaut dropped during an EVA that's just floating around. The problem is, just floating around, it's going thousands of miles an hour, just floating around. And if it should be going, a th you know, thousands of miles an hour in the opposite direction from you going thousands of miles an hour, that's going to poke a pretty big hole in whatever it is you're in. So it's really important that we ha that this stuff up there avoid collision. So that's why it's got these Krypton thrusters. These satellites have these Krypton thrusters to keep in position. Of course, the position's carefully calculated so they will not, in fact run into anybody but they've got to keep that position station keeping they got to keep right where they are because if there's a collision the risk is something they call bum 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 the kessler effect so uh my friend daniel suarez who just wrote a great novel called delta v was the guy who taught me about the kessler effect uh and actually there's another good book that i recently read by neil stevenson called seven eves that also talks about the kessler syndrome you might also call it Collisional cascading. It was uh, first envisioned by a NASA scientist named Kessler, obviously, in 1978, where it's a scenario where the density of objects in low Earth orbit, where Elon's satellites are, is so high that collisions in between the objects could cause a cascade, in, kind of a pinball effect, in which each collision generates space debris, which then collides again and again and again. And what could happen... Already, there are estimated 600,000 pieces of space junk floating around. What could happen is a cascade effect where you get so much debris that we're, in fact, shrouded by debris. You, The sun would be blocked out. That would be kind of catastrophic for us, but would also uh, eliminate the ability to leave Earth orbit because you couldn't get out of it. We'd be in jail. Actually, that's part of the uh, one of the things that happens in Fallen Dragon. Remember that? The great Peter F. Hamilton book? They want to avoid alien invasion, so they actually set off a Kessler syndrome to close the sky, meaning aliens can't land. So there's some benefit. Maybe Elon's, you know, Elon has some interesting um, ideas about things. Maybe Elon's trying to protect us from alien invasion. <laughs> He's so strange. I wouldn't be surprised. So I don't know if the FCC is responsible for maintaining, <laughs> you know, keeping us from getting a Kessler syndrome. I don't think that's probably something they're looking at. They did approve 12,000 satellites, but did they really, you know, question? Now, Elon, your Teslas aren't supposed to run into each other either. And occasionally they do. You, 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 you're pretty sure this is going to work, right? Oh, yeah, that's going to work. I was going to put 420 satellites up, but now I think 12,000 is a better number. In uh, Seven Eves, Neil Stevenson's book, there the Kessler, the moon get, uh, gets hit and splits into so many pieces of debris that the sun is blotted out and the Earth dies. Yikes! But it would at least prevent escaping the Earth's atmosphere. I hope it doesn't happen. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. On the other hand, I love the idea of uh, internet access everywhere. That 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 is. I think you can. You, you, there are there have been things that have happened in our lifetime that have changed the world, my lifetime anyway. Television is one. Television, you know, many, many things contributed to the fall of the Soviet Union, but we really shouldn't ignore the fact that TV brought a, a vision of the world that was different from the Soviet vision into the lives of average Soviets. It's one of the reasons North Korea blocks television from the outside. The internet, 10 times that effect, 1,000 times that effect. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. In our last installment, we reviewed the events that took place between 1951 and 1953. In that two-year period, the Class A 
B, and C licenses had been renamed the Advanced, General, and Conditional Class licenses respectively. Three new licenses had been created, the Extra, Technician, and Novice. Also during that period, 40 meters was finally opened to phone operation after being a CW only band for years. We lost the top 50 kilocycles of 20 meters, but gained our new 15 meter band. The advanced class was closed to new applicants, although those holding this license could still renew. And in a surprising decision, the FCC opened all phone bands to the general and conditional class operators. Previously, Holders of Class B and C licenses could only operate HF phone on 10 meters. Now all amateurs, conditional to extra class, had the same on-the-air operating privileges. Many amateurs resented the fact that the advanced and extra class operators had no exclusive frequencies and that there was no incentive for a general or conditional class license to upgrade. Some of these complaints filtered their way to the ARRL. And so, in the February 1963 issue of QST, an editorial appeared in which the ARRL expressed regret over the abandonment of the incentive license structure, called the 1952 decision a step backward, and proposed a new incentive licensing system be implemented. The idea of exclusive frequencies for advanced and extra class hams at the expense of the generals and conditionals drew volumes of mail in response. Some of the comments printed in QST included, Absolutely outrageous. Ridiculous. Your editorial hits the nail on the head. Thought-provoking. Congratulations to the ARRL and to hell with the ARRL. The responses in QST were about evenly split for and against. There were a few letters from generals and conditionals who supported the idea of incentive licensing even though they would clearly lose under the proposal. On May 3, 1963, the ARRL Board of Directors adopted their official position on incentive licensing. Their proposal would completely take away all general and conditional class phone privileges on 75, 40, 20, and 15 meters in a two-year phase-in period. In other words, the ARRL's incentive licensing would only allow HF phone operation for generals and conditionals on 10 meters and on the small sliver of 160 meters that was available in the days of Loran radio navigation. The ARRL also suggested reopening the advanced class license again to those who held a general or conditional class license for one year. Strangely, the ARRL did not suggest that extras be given exclusive frequencies, nor did they propose exclusive CW frequencies for the extras. Rather, they just wanted exclusive access to the 75 through 15 meter phone segments for the advanced and extra class licenses. Again, the mail poured in pro and con. Many hams felt betrayed for, at this time, the ARRL was running a building fund drive to raise $250,000 to construct the headquarters that now stands at 225 Main Street in Newington, Connecticut. In effect, they believe the ARRL was saying, thanks for your donation, now say goodbye to your HF phone privileges. They were not happy. On April 1, 1965, the FCC, in response to the ARRL proposal and proposals submitted by others, released their own version of incentive licensing. For generals and conditionals, the FCC proposal was not as bad as the leagues. The FCC would take away about 50% of their phone frequencies on 75 through 15 meters, but they would still have access to half of each phone band. For the advanced class license, formerly Class A, it was a disaster. The FCC, instead of reopening the advanced class, proposed creating a new amateur first class. This license would have a code speed of 16 words per minute. Worse, the FCC would bump the present advanced class operators down to general upon renewal. Now it was the advanced class licensees who were outraged. Prior to 1952, they had held the top license. Now, in effect, they would be demoted two grades and lose 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands. The FCC also proposed exclusive 50 kilocycle CW subbands for extra class licensees on 80 through 15 meters, 
small exclusive phone segments for extras, and incentive restrictions on 6 and 2 meters. For the next two years, 1965 through 1967, the battle raged on. Hundreds of proposals and counterproposals were made. The ARRL opposed any incentive subbands on 6 and 2 meters and worked to retain the advanced class in lieu of the proposed amateur first class license. On August 24, 1967, the FCC announced its decision. There would not be a new amateur first class ticket or a 16 word per minute requirement. The advanced class would not be demoted to general, but rather would be reopened as the intermediate step between the general and extra. In summary, the FCC rules established a three step phase in of incentive licensing to begin on November 22nd, 1967. On that day, the advanced class was reopened to new applicants after a 15 year freeze and novices were given a two-year non-renewable license instead of the previous one-year non-renewable term. On November 22, 1968, novices lost their two-meter voice privileges. Generals, conditionals, and technicians lost the first 100 kilocycles of six meters. The first 25 kilocycles of the 80 through 15 meter CW bands became extra only and generals and conditionals lost about 25% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands, which were given to the advanced and extra class hams. Comments and opinions still poured into the FCC and the ARRL, requesting anything from total abandonment of incentive licensing to even more restrictive allocations. Most of the comments suggested that the third phase, scheduled for implementation on November 22, 1969, was too severe. Upon review, the Commission agreed in part. Thus, on September 24, 1969, the FCC scaled back the schedule changes. As a result, technicians, conditionals, and generals did not lose the 50.1 through 50.25 megacycle segment of 6 meters, where most of the sideband activity was, and the extra class CW subbands were kept at 25 kilocycles. After November 22, 1969, Generals and conditionals had only 50% of the 75 through 15 meter phone bands. Advanced had about 90% and extra class licenses retained 100% of their previous allocations. On a final note, the FCC in its report and order adopting incentive licensing had refused to increase the VHF operating privileges for technicians and had taken away novice voice operations on two meters. There was a reason for this. The FCC wanted novices to bypass the technician class license and go right to general. Why? In our next installment, we will journey back to the amateur world in the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s to take a closer look at the technician class license and the unique position it held. I hope you'll be with me. Bruce Page, KK5DO, is back this year with his AMSAT update, and with the new year comes a new satellite. The TJ Reverb was launched by the International Space Station on December 29th of 2022. It has an APRS digipeter on 145.25 MHz and was built entirely by students at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in Alexandria, Virginia. Hence the TJ and TJ Reverb. What is really great about this satellite is that students, without the help of a university or industry, built the satellite. They designed and coded as well as integrated the satellite themselves. This is proof that any school should be able to build a CubeSat. No kit required. And if you're looking for a nice grid, catch Chris, VO2AC and VO2AAA to be operating from GO11 in Labrador from January 24th through the 27th. It's time for the Weekly Propagation Forecast Report, brought to us each week by Tad Cook, K7RA, in Seattle, Washington, who reports this week that two new sunspot groups emerged on December 29th, 2022, one more on December 30th, and another on January 1st, 2023, New Year's Day. Solar activity was a little higher, with average daily sunspot numbers rising from 96.1 to 97, and solar flux averages rose 14 points to 157.8. So looking ahead, the predicted solar flux will be 152 on January 7th and 8th, 150, 148, and 146 on January 9th through the 11th, 150 on January 12th and 13th, 145 on January 14th, 
140 on January 15th and 16th, and 145 on January 17th through the 19th. A quick look at the predicted planetary A and dice. It will be 10 on January 7th, 5 on January 8th through the 16th, and 8, 12, 25, 20, and 10 on January 17th through the 21st. In radio sport contesting this week, January 5th through the 6th, the Walk for the Bacon QRP contest continues. That is CW. January 6th, the QRP Fox Hunt, CW. The, on January 6th as well, the K1USN Slow Speed Test, that's CW. January 7th, the Bodexus 070 Club PSK Fest, that's digital. January 7th through the 8th, the uh, WWPMC Contest, that's CW and phone. January 7th and 8th also, the SKCC Weekend Sprintathon, that's CW. And on January 7th, the RSGB AFS Contest, that is CW as well. And you can visit ARL.org slash contest calendar for more events and more information. Some upcoming section of state division conventions on January 7th, the Ham Radio University hosting the ARRL New York City Long Island Section Convention. That is an online event. January 20th through the 21st, the Southwest Florida Regional Ham Fest hosting the ARRL Southern Florida Convention. That's in Fort Myers, Florida. January 20th through the 21st, Cowtown Ham Fest, hosting the ARRL North Texas Section Convention. That's in Forest Hills, Texas. January 27th through the 28th, the Capital City Ham Fest 2023, hosting the ARRL Mississippi State Convention in Jackson, Mississippi. And on January 28th, Winterfest, hosting the ARRL Midwest Division Convention. That's in Collinsville, Illinois. The Australia Day Contest is back on again this year, given the huge participation last year, with some new distance rules being implemented and the inclusion of FT8 and FT4. The aim of the contest is to encourage amateurs in VK to contact other amateurs around the world. Some VK operators will be using the AX prefix to celebrate Australia Day. Some will be using the special VJ and VL prefixes, which are sought after around the world. Others may just use the traditional and well-known VK prefix. Scoring is distance-based and calculated using four character grid squares. It will be held on Australia Day, January 26, from 2200 UTC on January 25th to 10 o'clock UTC, January 26th. For full rules and sections to enter, see the Wireless Institute of Australia website. Foundations of Amateur Radio in 2016, Daniel, Echo Alpha 4 Golf Papa Zulu, documented how to discover the weakest signal that could be decoded using several weak signal modes, including Whisper or Weak Signal Propagation Reporter. This is an interesting question because, as you might recall, I've been experimenting with very weak signals coming from my shack. To date, my 20 milliwatts has been heard over 13,000 kilometers away. When you tune to a weak station, you'll often hear both the station or desired signal as well as interference or background noise. The stronger the signal, the less noise you perceive. The weaker the signal, the more noise. You can express the relationship between the power of these two, the signal and the noise, as a ratio. If the power levels are the same, the so-called signal-to-noise ratio, or SNR, is 1 to 1. A higher ratio, like 2 to 1, indicates that the power of the signal is higher than the noise, and a lower ratio, like 1 to 2, indicates that the signal is lower than the noise. If you express this ratio in decibels, you'll end up with positive numbers where the signal is stronger than the noise, and negative numbers where the signal is weaker than the noise, and zero when they're the same. If I tell you that the signal report for my whisper decode from Denmark was minus 28 dB, it means that the noise was much stronger than the signal. For today, I'm going to leave alone just how whisper can report a negative signal-to-noise ratio and still successfully decode the signal, even though the signal appears to be buried in the noise. That said, in this experiment, we are trying to learn something else. Using the technique detailed by Daniel, we test using different, known, signal-to-noise ratios to discover at what point the whisper decoding process breaks down. This might help me understand if I can reduce my beacon output power even further and still anticipate a good chance of being decoded successfully. 
To conduct his experiment, Daniel used the then current version of WSJTX, version 1.7.0, release candidate 1, and I'm using the current version today, 2.6.0, release candidate 5, to repeat those tests. You might ask why I'm not taking Daniel's word for it and just using his findings. The process to decode a whisper signal is all software and can be improved with better methodologies and algorithms. It's not unreasonable to think that in the years since Daniel's experiments, things have changed, hopefully improved. So how does this work? If you generate an attempt to decode 100 different files, you can use the number of times that you count your call sign in the decode list as a percentage of success. If all of your files decode properly, the decode percentage is 100%. If only half of them are decoded successfully, it's 50%, and so on. Similarly, if a different call sign locator or signal power is decoded, you can count those as a percentage of false decodes. This is important because noise coming from the ionosphere can corrupt any signal. I should point out that because we know in advance what the decoded signal should be, since we created the message, we can actually count the ones that don't match what we sent. In the real world, it's very hard, if not impossible, to do this, unless each transmitter also starts recording their efforts, so data cleaning can be done after the fact. A false decode happens when the software decodes a message and the result is not what was sent. Due to the way that Whisper works, this is not a case of a single character error, and as a result, the whole message is corrupt, wrong call sign, wrong grid square, and wrong power level. Just how prevalent this issue is has, to my knowledge, so far not been discussed. Over the past year, I've been working with the entire Whisper dataset, nearly 5 billion reports, and mapping the data to explore just what's going on behind the scenes. Based on the raw data, every single grid square on the planet has been activated. Of course, this is not really the case, since there's plenty of parts on Earth where we haven't yet turned on a Whisper beacon. Back to our experiment. Two tools are used, Whisper Sim to generate an audio file and Whisper D to decode it. Both come with WSJTX, and when you build the application from source, you get them as part of the process. The generator takes several parameters, one of which is the desired signal-to-noise ratio. If you ask it for a signal-to-noise ratio of minus 20 dB, Whisper Sim will generate the appropriate noise and the desired signal, combine them, and build an audio file. You can then use Whisper D to decode that file. If you repeat this many times, you can end up with some data. How many times? Well, I probably went a little overboard. I generated a set for each SNR reading between 0 and minus 50 dB in 0.01 dB increments, and then generated 100 for each of those. At the point where the process broke down, I doubled the resolution further to get a better idea of what was going on. About three quarters of a million tests. It took a while. What did I learn from this? First of all, false decodes happen at every signal level. I saw the first false decode at a signal-to-noise ratio of minus 0.07 dB. This is significant because it means that even at excellent signal levels, there is a percentage of incorrect reports which explains why I'm seeing that result in real-world data. When you start playing with really big numbers, even if the error rate is low, with enough data it starts to matter. In my tests I saw an error rate of 0.03%. This means that there's at least 1.5 million false decodes in the current Whisper dataset, likely more because Whisper Sim cannot emulate the real world of ionospheric and local noise. On the flip side, I also saw an overall success rate of nearly 94%. At minus 29 dB, things start to change. Until then, the decode is 100% successful. Then it starts to decline to zero at about minus 34 dB. Comparing Daniel's results directly, he saw 34% success at minus 30 dB. I'm seeing 95% at that same noise level. At minus 31 dB, Daniel saw 6%. I'm seeing 75%. I don't see 34% until we get down to minus 31.6 dB, and 6% at minus 32.4 dB. This indicates that the software has improved over the years. 
It also means that with a signal report of minus 28 dB from Denmark, I've got a few dB to play with. I've now reduced my output power by another 3 dB, making it 10 milliwatts. Point your antennas at VK6 and see what you can hear on 10 meters. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. I'm Will Rogers, K5 WLR. Technology has not overtaken us, it has left us far behind. We're having our bitter fights over the deck chairs on the Titanic with Morse code and so forth. The words of Wayne Green, W2NSD. Does the name Wayne Green ring a bell with you? Wayne was founder of both 73 Magazine and Radio Fun Magazine. He published 73 for almost half the 20th century prior to his passing in 2013, 10 years ago. While Wayne had the reputation of being Ham Radio's gloom and doomer, he showed a side of himself during a 1992 Dayton Hamvention forum few have seen or heard. Here's Wayne with a new realization for Ham Radio. Well, I've been kind of wondering what to talk about. Uh, normally every year I say the same thing, and everybody says, wow, that's great. And I said, gee, there must be something else I can talk about this year. So I've been thinking about that. One thing that I mentioned last month in my editorial is worth talking about, and that has to do with a justification for ham radio. Technology has not overtaken us. It has left us far behind, and we're having our bitter fights over the deck chairs on the Titanic with Morse code and so forth. And Morse code was okay when I got my license, and I have had my 50-year plaque with the ARL for several years now. The world is digital. It has been for several years. LP records are now found in antique stores and not in record stores much anymore. And we still have people fighting over Morse code and AM and other leftovers from the 20s and 30s. When we should be all digital on the air, because it isn't going to be long before FM radio is out, and digital broadcasting is in. And if you've read my editorial, you know there have been tests of this over in England, and they found that with one one-hundredth of the power, they had roughly 10 times the coverage from the same location. They used a little 9-watt digital broadcast transmitter versus about 1,000-watt FM, and the coverage was roughly nine times as great with a perfect signal. And it had one other advantage for those of you that are not familiar with digital, and that is that you can have six stations on each channel. And so you just have a little switch to whichever channel you want or whichever station you want on the channel you're tuned to. If you can get kids into this hobby, we'll have kids developing digital voice communications. And the difference is that you will have far more coverage with less power, no fading, you'll have sound quality that'll knock your ears off, satellites, and you will have no interference because you'll be able to have six, eight, or 10, or 15 people all at one frequency talking at one time with no interference, time shared. And I know that a lot of old timers are going to hate it when I say that the no code license has helped enormously to bring more hams into the hobby. <laughs> and we're getting a lot of youngsters. And I'm just so delighted at the 73 booth to have people come up and say, hey, we just got 10 new people licensed. Hey, we just got 16 new licensed. We've got a school club going now. We've got a school club going. And I say, send pictures, send pictures, send pictures. I want to rub everybody's eyes into this and let them know what's happening and know that they can do it too, that you can do it too. It's you that have to do this. It's the other people in your ham club that have to do this. It isn't going to happen by itself. I'm still getting letters, and I hate to see them, but I'm seeing letters almost every day from new licensees saying, gee, I went down to the local ham club, and they made it very clear that they didn't want me to come. And so what I've recommended, and I've had a couple of people come by and say, we took you to heart on this. I recommend it. If you have trouble with the local hand club, start your own. And they're doing this, and it's working. You can make a difference, every one of you. I'm trying hard to make a difference, not just in amateur radio, but in New Hampshire. 
And I've made enough of a fuss up there so they know I'm there. And when they formed an Economic Development Commission last year, the governor appointed me to the commission. And I've been raising hell and putting a brick under it. But I haven't been doing anything that every one of you couldn't have done and couldn't do now. You have to speak out. You have to make yourself known. You have to do your homework, too. It isn't worthwhile to speak out and make yourself known if you're wrong. I do a lot of homework. If you've read my editorials, you know I've been writing about education for a long time. Well, I've been doing a lot more homework on this because there's an opportunity in New Hampshire to completely revamp the educational system. And boy, does it need revamping. We have, as I'm sure you know, and the teachers hate, oh, I get the hate letters from teachers on this. We have one of the worst educational systems in the developed world. But you can change this. You can get on your local school board. You can get on committees in the state. And it is possible to do this. I haven't done anything that other people couldn't do. And I'm going to do everything possible to make a change. I'm proposing a change in our whole system right from year one on through to college graduate. 60% of the people in America have not read one single book since getting out of school. We need to get across the concept that education is a lifelong process and that going to school is just the start. It gives you the fundamentals. But it is difficult for many people to learn more and to teach themselves more. I had a heck of a job when Solid State came along. All of a sudden, I had to start over from scratch. And I remember an editorial in QST. Anybody here read QST? <laughs> One, two, okay, three, four, all right? In 1968, saying that the reason QST did not run Solid State articles is because hams were tube people and that Solid State would never be as good as tubes and hams would always be tubes people. And this was the technical editor of QST in 1968. We have a hobby that is so much fun that it should be illegal. We have an enormous amount of fun to offer. The kids would go crazy if they knew what we had here. But we've been very fortunate. We've kept this a secret. 29 years ago, we closed down virtually every radio club and schools in America. And we have a few hundred today. We used to have over 5,000 school radio clubs. And the ARL people get mad at me when I point out that incentive licensing proposed in 1963 not only killed the whole amateur radio industry, but it wiped out virtually every radio club in schools in the country. And I went back to my high school, which had W2ANU since about 1920, and there is no radio club. And here's a school of 10,000 students. And in school after school, I found this. I got King Hussein to put radio clubs in virtually every school in Jordan. And the kids had a ball. I went over two years later, or three years later, and met over 400 licensed amateurs in that tiny country. And they were excited. And Sherry and I were over there a few years ago, and they held a special meeting of the Royal Jordanian Amateur Radio Society, at which Prince Rod, who is the president of the society, said that I had had more of an effect on the country of Jordan than anyone other than King Hussein, just by putting amateur radio in there. Well, you can do this if you travel talk to the heads of these countries and point out the only way your country is going to be viable in the future is if you're able to cope with the information age, with communications, and with electronics. And the kids will learn this and love it if they have an opportunity. And your kids and your grandchildren will too. But only if you do something. And that concludes our short time listening to the ham radio communicator, Wayne Green, W2NSD, founder of 73 Magazine and Radio Fun. He published 73 through the 1960s into 2000. Wayne Green became a silent key in 2013, 10 years ago. QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo Administrator Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, 
has announced that the next QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo will take place on March 24th through the 26th, 2023, asking the question, new ham radio license, now what? With almost 800,000 licensed hams in the USA, the majority are not on the air. Why is that? And what happened from the time they passed their test to now? How many new hams think their only option is a Baofeng radio on the local repeater? How many unanswered calls do they make before giving up? How many new hams think that they have to keep upgrading their license to a higher level before they can get on the air? Organizers are looking for speakers who can address this topic in particular, whether the new license is at entry level, such as a technician class here in the United States, or perhaps at a higher level with more privileges. Guth is asking amateurs with expertise in certain areas of amateur radio to consider newcomers in particular and to offer presentations at the expo this spring. For more details, visit the Virtual Ham Expo on the web at www.qsotodayhamexpo.com. Srikanta Paul, the scientist who was recently granted a patent for the world's smallest antenna, has been given an honorary life membership in the West Bengal Radio Club. Born in West Bengal, he is a research professor at Birla Institute of Technology in Kolkata. He was presented with the honor on Wednesday, December 28th by the club's secretary, Ambarish Nagbizwaz, VU2JFA, who said in a text message that the professor has taken a keen interest in amateur radio antennas. After learning more details about the kind of work the club is involved in, he said that, as an honorary life member, he would study some useful types of antennas that hams could use for emergency response in disasters. In 2009, the professor was credited with having helped solve satellite signal interference problems at the Robert C. Byrd Green Bank Telescope at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory in West Virginia. Later, he assisted astronomers in solving interference issues at the Jadrell Bank Radio Telescope site in the United Kingdom. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. Mounting repeater antennas upside down. When you're a repeater owner and you have the opportunity to move your system to a new tower, sometimes the mounting site you are offered is an upside down mount. This means your antenna will be hanging upside down from the way it's designed. Water can become a real problem in this instance. From time to time, I've had to deal with these placements too. Over the years, I have talked to technical people at different antenna manufacturers and run into the same methods of modifying antennas for upside down mounting. Generally, a fiberglass shroud encased antenna needs to be modified with the addition of two small holes you drill yourself. A 1 8 inch hole near the top cap or in the side near the top end will drain any water in the main body of the antenna. Those antennas that have a separate mount which consists of an aluminum tube with two clamps and a set screw, then the coax is fed through the tube and attached directly to the bottom of the antenna. You will need to drill another hole near the level of the connector. This will allow water to drain from the mounting tube instead of entering into the antenna body by way of the coax connector. Now you've modified your antenna for upside down mounting. There's one more problem. You'll need to seal the top end of the mounting tube to keep rainwater from entering in the first place. Here, I use silicone caulk. Be careful not to get any on the coax connector hardware. Some silicone cure systems can attack copper. I build a seal around the tube and the coax and apply more to the coax to form a small mound above the bottom of the mounting tube. After the caulking cures, you can add another sealant like coax seal for added protection. Don't forget to secure the coax during the curing time so holes don't form in the silicone plug you've just made. I've known of people using flaps cut from truck tire inner tubes to cover the entrance of the coax into the mounting tube. This also keeps sunlight off the silicone and is known to be very long lasting. The best philosophy is to use a few layers of protection, making sure each one is chemically different from the others. So if one fail, the others are different and more likely to survive. Here's a common repeater antenna failure I've seen. The common practice is to use a short jumper coax to go between the antenna and the upper end of the hard line. 
be sure to secure as much of it to the antenna mount or sidearm. You want the jumper to move with the tower, antenna, and mounting hardware, but not flex much on its own. One of the most common failures I have seen in repeater systems is improperly installed jumper cable. The most common failure was flexing caused by the wind breaking the outer conductor of the coax jumper. Perhaps you've encountered some others. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. The Southwest Ohio DX Association has launched a program that recognizes the hams who help other hams achieve their first 100 confirmed DX entities. The amateur receiving the assistance must be under the age of 30, and the DX Association has specifically designed the award this way to target those who help younger amateurs and ensure they continue to be encouraged and active in the hobby even after receiving their ARRL run DXCC certificate. The intent of targeting this audience of younger amateurs is to attract and retain those operators who are most likely to remain engaged in the hobby after achieving DXCC. The DX Mentor Recognition Program has the support of the Northern California DX Foundation and the International DX Association. Both groups are providing representatives on the judging committee. The award will be presented during Dayton Hamvention 2023 in May. A 500-foot asteroid passing just twice the distance from Earth to the moon was recently the target of radio signals emitted by a powerful transmitter deep within the heart of Alaska as part of an effort to enhance our ability to detect potentially deadly space objects. The experiment, which bounced long-wave radio signals off the surface of the passing object, to reveal information about its interior and composition was conducted last week at Alaska's High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, or HARP Research Facility, near Gakana. The test, which targeted an asteroid called 2010 XC-15, was part of a joint research effort with NASA to prepare for the arrival of the 1,100-foot-wide asteroid Apophis in 2029. Discovered in 2004 and originally believed to pose a potential threat to Earth with the decades ahead, it is now believed that the object's close approach will not pose any direct threat to Earth. Mark Hayes, a radar systems engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the project's lead investigator, said last week's experiment marked the first time an asteroid was monitored in such a way and at such low frequencies. The data that was collected will be analyzed in the weeks ahead with findings from the research effort published later this year. Hayes added that the experiment shows the value of HARP as a potential future research tool for the study of near-Earth objects. Although several similar efforts involving planetary defense against asteroid impacts are currently underway, the long-wavelength radio signals that HARP employs can also provide information about the interior of such objects, not just their exterior shape and size. Understanding the composition of asteroids and other details about their makeup and interior could potentially provide crucial data in future efforts towards defending against such an object should one ever pose a direct threat to our planet. According to NASA, each year at least one car-sized asteroid will collide with Earth's atmosphere, burning up before ever striking the surface and producing a vivid fireball as it streaks across the sky during entry. However, larger asteroids approaching the size of a modern football field also strike the Earth every couple of thousand years. Fortunately, objects large enough to cause widespread cataclysmic damage to our planet only cross paths with us every few million years. Still, preparing for such eventualities had been the driving force behind the successful first test of NASA's Double Asteroid Redirection Test Mission, or DART, on September 26, 2022. Following Tuesday's experiment, more than 300 reception reports from amateur radio operators and citizen scientists tracking the effort were logged, according to HARP Program Manager Jessica Matthews who said in a press release that data had been provided for, from the amateur radio and radio astronomy communities from six continents who confirmed the HARP transmissions. A joint program of the University of Alaska Fairbanks and military partners that include the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, HARP, was originally conceived as a program to study the thin layer of Earth's atmosphere between 50 and 600 miles from Earth known as its ionosphere for its potential use in surveillance and radio communications. The HARP facility is currently operated by the University of Alaska at Fairbanks. Alfred A. Lawn III, K3ZO of Temple Hills, Maryland, passed away on January 3, 2023. He was a member of the ARRL Maxim Society and Life member and a member of the Potomac Valley Radio Club. 
Lon was also a director for the Asby Foundation, an organization that supports awards and grants that recognize and advance the achievements made by radio amateurs. Fred's service to Yasmi and other amateur organizations spanning decades was unsurpassed, as were his contributions to amateur radio, for which he cared deeply, said Yasmi Foundation President Ward Silver and Zero AX in a press release. Well known and respected around the globe, we know Fred's many friends worldwide will honor his memory both on and off the air. If you are into CW, here's a quick story for you. AMSAT Straight Key Night eventually became AMSAT's CW Activity Day, an event devoted to amateurs who enjoy Morse code operating via linear satellites. The event was held this year on January 1st, but even while it was still in the planning stages, it underwent yet another name change. This year, it became the W2RS Memorial AMSAT CW Activity Day. The new name honors satellite pioneer Ray Soifer, W2RS, who became a silent key in March of 2022 at the age of 79. The CW Activity Day had been his project, and he organized the New Year's Day event for AMSAT with great enthusiasm. He encouraged hams to make good use of their straight keys and bugs and report their progress on AMSAT's bulletin board mailing list. As always, this activity is held at the same time the ARRL holds its own straight key night every New Year's. And finally this week, according to the Debrief newsletter, robotics is advanced enough to allow for self-driving cars and even surgical robots. The era of household robot servants has not yet arrived. Companies like Amazon, Tesla, and Boston Dynamics are ramping up their efforts to create the humanoid robots of tomorrow. There are many challenges to overcome in developing such technologies. Now, one expert in the field of robotics from Ohio State University says that such technological hurdles indicate we are still a good way from seeing household robots in every home. Today, many different types of robots are being implemented in different areas of society, mainly in factories or warehouses. But according to Dr. A. Young Harid, an associate professor at Ohio State University, household robots are a breed apart from what we see in these industries. This is an autonomous device that could be deployed in a home to do some simple daily tasks, he explained in an interview with The Debrief. For example, a robot can cook a meal or do laundry or clean. A more useful one could assist elderly people in a nursing home. One of the biggest challenges that these types of robots face is interacting with a wide variety of objects. Unlike factory robots, which may only interact with boxes or other objects, household robots have to interact with a wider range of objects in an unstructured manner. From wood floors to toys to dogs, these robots have to be prepared for any situation. Especially in homes with growing children running around or pets, these robots need special sensors to detect what's happening around them. In a factory setting or warehouse distribution, you have a nice structured environment. There is a finite number of places for the robot to go, Harid says. But in a household, everything is constructed differently. So how robots can handle these kind of uncertainties in this environment is a big challenge. Harid and other researchers are looking into the possibility of using artificial intelligence to help at-home robots, but the process is rather tricky. With AI, we often focus on the digital world instead of objects, Harid said. While AI may be able to help a robot better analyze a household environment using sensors and data prediction models, it ultimately won't help in making this unstructured setting more predictable. Due to these challenges, Harid predicts that household robot servants won't be here for at least a decade. However, many companies are hoping to reduce this timeline. Dyson is working to have a cleaning robot available, Harid said. But how long will it be to get other robots into a household? I assume we'll have a pretty long way to go, he said. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on amateur radio repeater systems, streaming on the internet, or on great low-power FM broadcast stations like WGXC-FM, part of the Wave Farm on 90.7 MHz in Akron, New York, serving Greene County and the southern regions of New York's Capital District. Many of the news and information items heard on this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Audio News Service, and the ARRL Letter, the Southgate Amateur News Service, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain, and OFCOM, the South African Radio League, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, and the Australian Communications and Media Authority, the New Zealand Association of Radio Transmitters, the Amateur Radio Newsline, The Rain Hamcast, Eric Guth, 4Z1UG and QSO Today, QRZ.com, The Tech Guy, Leo Laporte, 
the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you'd like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at TWIAR.net. And now, for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio headquarters and our news team around the world, this is Chris Perrine, KB2FAF, wishing you a 70s 